Today on Connected Farmer, we are having Jay Brandt. He is the he is a member of the Walnut Creek Company, and he's going to explain and tell every farmer in Ohio how to start with cover crops in Ohio step by step. If you are liking us, please sub subscribe, click the bell button for notifications, or like us. Jay, how are you today? Hey, doing great, thank you. So Jay, uh, what farmers need to have in mind in order to start uh, cover crops? So generally you want to have some goal in mind. Uh, what is the outcome of utilizing that practice, right? So is it uh, for protecting the soil from erosion, whether it be from rainfall or heavy floods or sun, heat, things of that nature, uh, to add value as a forage crop or to add fertility. In the case of uh, you have a high demanding crop like corn, uh, so you want to reduce purchase chemical fertility and use more natural, uh, cover crops can do that for you. Yes, and uh, what specifically the soils in Ohio have in difference uh, compared to other states so that you need to have in mind before taking the first steps? Uh, Ohio is quite diverse in soil types, but primarily uh, clay type soil, right, that holds water. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so one of the things a lot of guys look for is to improve that water infiltration to open up the clay soil. Uh, but there are, of course, some sandy areas because there's river bottoms and uh, near lake bed type scenarios where you have to take care that the crops might not take away too much water. So there's a couple considerations there. Uh, but in all cases, we're looking to right, protect the soil from erosion because that is a big concern in a lot of areas, especially with the significant weather events that we're having recently. And that's one of the easy or low hanging fruit that cover crops provide. And uh, what uh, should be the first step as you are starting? Uh, the first step is to put the plan in place, right? Because uh, you need to pre prepare yourself for good success. Uh, so just like you plan your major crops, you want to plan for the cover crops in that case. So looking at your rotation and your manpower limitations and equipment limitations, uh, start with that and look at what you want to do. A simple first step is to broadcast seeds after harvest. Uh, most folks do have a small broadcast spreader and they're able to spread a simple uh, winter kill cover crops. Uh, and that way you don't have any management concerns in the spring. Uh, for folks that are more familiar with small grain management, winter hardy crops like rye, uh, barley, and triticale are very popular and are an easy entry into certain crop rotations. And what are the ex specific uh, crops that, that uh, would you use frequently as cover crops uh, there? Right, so if we look primarily at the, uh, the major crop rotation is corn and soybeans in Ohio. Uh, small percentage have a three crop rotation, corn, soybeans, and wheat or some other small grain crop such as oats. Uh, and so there's different options based on that. Cereal rye is probably by far and large uh, the most popular or most widely used cover crop. Uh, it crosses the boundaries between, you know, between any crop. Uh, there's a slightly different management between corn and soybeans. So with uh, soybeans, uh, cereal rye planted after corn harvest is a very popular and easy thing to do. Uh, it can be broadcast with uh, an airplane or a high clearance cedar uh, using a spinner spreader if you're applying uh, lime or potash in the fall. So there's a lot of ways that you can incorporate that into your rotation that allows uh, good soil stability over the winter 
and then you can either early terminate uh, or plant green, right? So you can plant into the live crop and then terminate after planting for soybeans and management based on using uh, non-traded or traded crops as a decision you make at that time as far as burn down chemical or using mechanical termination. So, and using cereal rye into corn, you have to be careful not to have too much seeding rate that you deplete the soil nitrogen and that you then have to add extra, you know, for your corn crop. And a lot of guys are doing this with good success, managing early nitrogen inputs, whether with uh, fertilizers or uh, synthetic inputs, as well as adding in-season uh, fertility management as well. And what are the common obstacles uh, when you plant corn and then uh, when you plant soybeans? Uh, corn is probably has the more obstacles, mainly because of that issue that the rye takes up so much soil fertility, the nitrogen, that you can leave the corn uh, depleted and nitrogen deficient. So that's why we always recommend, you know, 20 or 30 pounds of nitrogen at planting when you're planting into cereal rye, just to maintain that plant health. And we like split application of the nitrogen as well, and that helps carry the plant health through the season. Uh, sometimes, depending on the way your planter is set up, there may be some uh, mechanical interference uh, if the rye is large, where if you have row cleaners that are spiky or closing wheels that are spiky, you can get entanglement of the rye into those parts. And some guys actually get it into drive chains and things of that nature, depending on if it's fallen over or they're going against the grain, so to say. So sometimes some shielding is important just to protect those areas, like placing uh, backers behind uh, row cleaners or using more curve time or traditional OEM closers uh, minimize that risk with corn. Uh, in soybeans, there is there's very little risk. The difficulty is if you plant too much rye, getting uh, penetration with the seed openers to plant the seeds at the appropriate depth. And that you just have to be cautious and watch, you know, when you're planting as you normally would make sure that the planter is operating at the best efficiency. What would you need uh, to have in mind in terms of row distance? Seed spacing as far as row widths, uh, not too much unless you're looking at say an organic producer, you know, it's going to be on 30 inch rows. Uh, and that way they can, if they need a rescue pass with uh, uh, what they call a no-till cultivator or a high residue cultivator, uh, they have that option to get in there uh, because uh, as you get the narrow rows, it's just more difficult if you have weed escapes in some thin areas. So that's a concern from that standpoint. Um, it seems to work <clears throat> either way uh, with wide row spacings or narrow row spacings. So there's been success both ways. And what's the typical investment that the farmer should make to start uh, doing cover crops? I think the investment is mainly in the time to get yourself educated in that. There are several excellent resources available, uh, several podcasts uh, that we're involved in, such as this one, and a lot of YouTube resources, uh, a lot of available resources through uh, your county service agency as well, and the NRCS, so many guides, uh, a lot of practical experience. I would say for those starting, it's always good to find a mentor in your area someone that has done some of these practices before and that you can see their equipment and get their practical experiences, you know, in your area uh, that would be more applicable than say someone in a state away, right? Yeah. What's the typical time uh, to have uh, the first uh, results? Because uh, some farmers get uh, frustrated if in the first, seasons, they don't get the, the best results. Right, so normally we look at uh, three to five years, depending on uh, the intensity of your rotation and practice. Uh, usually when you're adopting cover crops, something as simple as oats in front of corn and cereal rye in front of soybeans, uh, you can see some advantage, at least in soil structure and uh, ease of planting, uh, when the conditions are correct. The improvement in your soil tilth and uh, planting conditions is greatly seen in that first year. Um, not necessarily that you see uh, some economic return until you've gone through a couple 
uh, rotational cycles just to build up that soil health and uh, start to have the advantage to reduce uh, synthetic inputs a little bit. And uh, what's the advantage in terms of uh, cutting spending over the, the years? Uh, and that's going to depend a lot on you know, yield goals and different uh, fertility practices that you have. We definitely think that uh, you can look at the cost of the cover crop seed and take that out then of your fertility management plan. And then as you watch your uh, soil tests change, uh, you can modify it based on that. So we generally do recommend looking at soil tests on a regular basis so that you can monitor that kind of change. And as well, you know, your yield and plant performance are also key indicators. Uh, we ourselves always look at reduced and excessive rates to see if there's based on the weather conditions in certain fields. But over time, as, as most farmers get experience with how fields react to fertility inputs, you will see that improvement in that practice, especially with the strip trials where you're looking at reduced inputs uh, so that you can get down to say in corn a nitrogen use efficiency of 0.6 on a regular basis and in some years uh, down to 0.5 or less as in regards to saying uh, the nitrogen use efficiency is one key indicator there. Uh, you can also watch phosphorus and potassium inputs uh, as far as really having the need for that and begin to reduce those uh, as well. Yes, and um, what are uh, the, the best examples of farmers uh, in your state? Uh, what did, do they have accomplished there? Uh, I think the big thing that we see is this reduction in uh, surface erosion. Uh, because we have the issue with the, uh, the soluble phosphorus uh, that we have in the streams. So, and that comes down to the, the first basic low fruit with cover crops is keeping the soil in place, right? And managing that. So we don't have uh, soil eroding from the surface and moving that soluble phosphorus into the water streams. So, and then we need to continue and build the practice of having living cover crops to reduce it as it uh, the effluent from drainage tile from that standpoint where we still have some mobile phosphorus uh, from field drainage as well, subsurface drainage. So those two key indicators there that improve water quality, uh, particulate matter, uh, water soluble phosphorus, those key things and nitrate levels also reduced in uh, the stream or the crop field runoff are two key things that have really improved with the adoption of cover crops. And uh, how, how often uh, the no tillage system is used there and uh, how important was that for the implementation of cover crops in Ohio? What's the rate of cover crops used there? Uh, so no till is a significant portion of the cropping systems in Ohio uh, and cover crop adoption is not necessarily tied completely to that. So we do see a lot of no-tillers utilizing cover crops maybe more frequently uh, from that standpoint, but not limited in that situation. There is quite a large population of conventional and organic farmers in Ohio that are really out realizing those, uh, the same principles of soil improvement, uh, tilth and fertility management with the adoption of cover crops. So a lot of it comes down to this issue of management uh, which we say uh, adoption of cover crops doesn't necessarily make management easier for you. Sometimes it's a little bit more of a challenge uh, because there's a little bit more planning involved to be successful. So I think we, we're seeing a uh, small adoption of cover crop across the board, maybe slightly higher in no-till acres just because there are potentially somewhat more no-till acres, although the fairly, as far as overall broad acre farming, uh, not too different uh, from that standpoint between conventional and no-till. And uh, what's the, the, your view about grazing? Do you usually add grazing there? Uh, some do from that standpoint. Uh, Ohio's not a huge uh, livestock uh, location. 
So there are some folks that are integrating grazing in that, uh, but for the most part, most uh, animal operations are specifically a confinement type. So there's limited uh, activity on that, but it is growing. There's much more interest and it is growing every year. Do you recommend adding grazing at some time? Certainly, we find that as part of uh, the soil health principles, right? Uh, adding diversity into the system. Uh, so the animal diversity as well brings in uh, not only uh, their manure uh, into the system, which we always like to have natural uh, fertility sources, uh, but the action of the grazing itself on the plants that stimulates plant roots and gives different types of uh, leakiness or exudates from the roots that help improve soil health and aid in uh, those benefits there. Jay, is there something else would you like to add? Um, <laughs> so again, we talked very specifically about some simple uh, cereal grains that we can use in cover crops. In Ohio, there's probably uh, two handfuls of staple cover crops that we use across the board uh, beyond cereal rye and oats. Uh, legumes that are very popular include uh, red clover, crimson clover, and hairy vetch. Uh, so those aid the, those farmers in rotation from soybeans to corn where you don't have uh, manure applications and you want to reduce applied fertility. Uh, those can be uh, somewhat seeded later in the year and they're winter hardy so you get that ability to carry over and have living plant roots around the year. Uh, the use of radish as a brassica and purple top turnip is also very popular uh, especially the turnip in the case of folks that are grazing corn stalks you know in rotation from corn to soybean so they'll spread on cereal rye radish and turnip uh, so allow better feed utilization of the corn stover when the cattle are grazing there. A um, couple of broad leaves that we use include buckwheat and sunflowers, uh, both of which have very strong root systems. The buckwheat is a shallow fibrous root that's somewhat acidic and helps make uh, phosphorus available for the next crop. And sunflowers with a branched tap root, and it uh, seems to bring more uh, micronutrients such as zinc and make them more available in the soil. At least that's what some of our soil tests have shown. Plus it's a benefit, beneficial attractor for bees and other pollinators and then is uh, visually appealing also. When you have that small grain and when you can get those sunflowers planted late summer and give them a chance to bloom. So that kind of rounds out the picture of those entry level cover crops. And you can make combinations of those, either two or three or all of them, uh, depending on what your desires are from that standpoint in regards to management and seed cost. Uh, but the, generally, uh, they will all work well. Like I said, the addition of the small grain in your crop rotation allows you that longer time to have that cover crop in place. It gives you a bigger rotational window as you move into your next crop, whether it be corn or soybeans. Hey, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, you are located in Ohio and, and your company is Walnut Creek Seed. Thank you very much. Thank you.